you get to talk to a lot of growers in a lot of different areas. We're kind of uh, well exposed to different ideas and uh, field observations. Uh, the disadvantage to that is every time a stinking new bug or pathogen comes along, we're at the center of it. <laughs> and so, um, so I'm here to, here to share both the, the good and the bad with you and, and hopefully just have a really open dialogue about what we're seeing. Um, I'm not a researcher. I, I leave empirical evidence restraints behind sometimes and talk about what I observe and what some of the inferences are. And I'm happy to have it clarified if it seems unobvious that no, that's not proven. I'll say, yes, you're right, that's not proven. Or here's the research and here's why I do believe it's proven. But uh, sometimes in farming, it's important to make decisions with incomplete information and to draw some inference of what we're observing uh, prior to these great researchers coming back to us with, with more information than we had previously um, in answering all of our questions. So that's a vineyard I have in a new wine growing region up in the Sierra. It's called Georgetown. That's a seven month old vineyard planted with Uber vines in 2014, uh, one year old Uber vines. So, so really today I'm going to talk about things framed around what's going on. Uh, how much do we know? And what should growers do? Because those are, those are the questions I get asked, uh, asked by my growers. So what's going on? First of all, Dwarty Nursery, has, and I think all nurseries, so I'm not trying to be specific to Dwarty Nursery, but Dwarty Nursery has invested heavily in testing and replanting increased blocks since 2012. It was, I think, November of 2012, the grape red blotch virus was characterized and a test became available for it. And the evidence was very compelling. Sometimes a disease idea comes along to a nursery and we're like, eh, I don't think that's making a lot of sense. This time the evidence was very compelling. There'd been um, a number of issues with grape vineyards not ripening, leaves turning red around the state. And when the people who brought forward the, the evidence on grape red blotch in uh, November of, I think it was 12, um, they, were, they had cred. And it was, it was people like Mark Fuchs, Sudi Mysator over at um, CDFA, Deborah Galino, Maher Rowini at um, FPS. This was the, these are the people you listen to when it comes to grape virus and they'd, they'd made a conclusion. Uh, so our increased blocks are cleaner than ever. We're delivering the cleanest plants ever. We'll show statistics on what we're finding. I'm, you know, we're, we're finding some virus out there. If you test, you find, rule number one. And um, we're testing and we're finding, but we think we're, we think we're managing our way through it. And as we're testing and finding and updating, new viruses are coming out. I guess we don't talk about red blotch as the new virus. That's the old new virus. The new new virus is Pinot Gris virus. And so that's a whole new class and order of virus. I think there'll be a speaker after me that, that'll be able to sort through those in, that bit of information more than I will. Um, and customers are calling. This is the part that really changed our presentation. A year and a half ago, we were given this presentation. Um, Tia Russell's our quality assurance manager. Sometimes she does this, sometimes I do it. Um, Given the presentation, talking about all the wonderful things we're doing at the nursery to, to keep virus material out of, out of the industry and to deliver clean plants. And then we, this last uh, summer, we started having customers call with reports of three to five year old vineyards up in the coast mainly, but also in Lodi, showing heavy virus infections. And when we went back to our records, which are available to our customers if they want to see the pedigree of what we sent them, um, we're finding these are clean vines. We have no evidence that this came from the nursery and we have other shipments of these same plants that are doing well. And, um, and so at that point we want to say what, there, there are field related issues. We can clean up the nursery and I think nurseries are getting very much cleaned up, but there are still field infection issues of some of these new viruses that we're, we're seeing really affect the economic lives of vineyards. So um, we talk about clean plants in the nursery. There's a quick overview. You can see the, pet, the, the deli cups. We do a lot of micropropagation. Um, we've done a lot of our new rootstock increase blocks through micropropagation to clean up some of the trunk fungus and diseases. Um, you see callusing water sanitation before and after UV treatment. We've got all kinds of ways of killing stuff in the air, in the water, sanitizing greenhouse with, with chlorine foamers, um, growing in non-soil media and 100% containerized. We don't do nursery fields. So we do a lot of things outside of the realm of virus to deliver clean plants. Our clean plant issues don't begin or end with virus. They're, um, they're quite broad. And um, one assurance you want from a nursery, I believe now, is irregardless of how clean or certified or 2010 protocol your budwood is, 
what are the nursery standards for bringing in budwood to be propagated the facility where your vines are propagated and clone and and grown you don't want your young vines near no pedigree budwood we do almost no table grapes not because we don't have the the capability to do table grape vines we don't want to bring in anyone's custom table grape budwood out of the south valley because of mealy bugs and a lack of attention to virus down there um, they just don't have the same problems that that northern growers have with those issues and they don't they don't manage them to a standard that would allow us to bring the budwood in and and we're almost doing i'd say virtually no custom grafting anymore um, we do have quality assured. A lot of you have seen tea around the industry. We'll go to a block of vines that we're familiar with that's not certified if we can't get enough of the clone through a certified program. We'll test it extensively. We'll inspect the field. We'll look at the field's history. Hopefully it's vines we propagated from certified stock at some time previously. And we'll bring in quality assured budwood. But in terms of a customer handing us a bundle of, bundle of cuttings and saying, this is my favorite curry Pinot Noir clone. Will you please go make me vines? No, we won't. Um, and that's important because this is how vines are grown. That's probably 100,000 vines in that far photo. There's probably a few hundred thousand vines in all the benches in this near photo. You're in close proximity. If, if there's a little mite or a leaf hopper or something in the greenhouse, it can vector with that kind of proximity. So, so nurseries have to be fairly selective of what they bring on site. Um, so in the virus programs, at the wedding nursery, we, we frame it around three things. Um, and this used to be the big bulk of our content of this presentation. Testing, we do a lot of testing of our increased blocks. Our customers have complete ability to test our increased blocks. Um, inspection, you can't test every vine every year that you're gonna make, make grape vines off of, but you can inspect every vine every year. And with red blotch, leaf roll three, we see them. If vines are infected with those, we're getting our, our ability to see them visually. We're seeing a high correlation between what we detect as visual, visually symptomatic and what comes back through testing is um, symptomatic. And so we, boots on the ground, walking of increased blocks is a, um, it should be a standard nursery practice. In rootstock, that's pretty vague because you can't really see a lot of these symptoms in rootstock varieties. You have to test more. And then um, replanting, you just, you know, a rootstock or any, a certified increased block is not a birthright to a nurseryman. Just because you planted it a certified five years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago doesn't mean you have the prerogative of taking certified cuttings off of it regardless of its actual disease standard for a generation, um, a human generation. You, they, they have to be removed when they're dirty. And, and sometimes blocks, because we find out something of a new disease or um, for unexplained reasons, they just get infected and they have to come out. So cycling over the top, cycling through rootstock blocks and budwood blocks is important. Um, so in our testing of mother blocks, just in all transparency, this is what we did. We have 380,000 vines of rootstock and sign in our certified mother blocks at the nursery. Um, they're all walked by Doherty Nursery and CDFA. Um, we tested both our, ourselves and through some of our customers who do custom clean plant work for their clients, 40,213 vines last year alone. Um, we walked them and found visually symptomatic vines of 288. Um, of, the, of the tested vines that we tested, the 40,000 tested, we found 59 positives. Uh, grape red blotch was 14, leaf roll 3 through 9. So some, you won't see, you'll see leaf roll 3, you won't see leaf roll 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 most of the time. They're um, latent viruses, they don't, they don't show up, but they are there. And then grapevine virus B, we found three vines. Again, that's pretty much a latent virus we don't see much from. And so we removed all those vines, of course, and another 2,900 buffer vines. And um, which comes down to us, if we take the suspect vines that we visually took out or the tested positive vines that we found, comes back to 0 0.03 of 1% infected. So this isn't coming from Foundation Plant Services anymore. These are vines being infected in clean mother blocks when the vines around them are not infected. So sometimes they use the analogy, it used to be if we had virus, it was because Foundation Plant Services 10 years earlier released Cabernet Clone 8 and had a trace of leaf roll that kind of slipped through the slipped through the works there. That's not what we're finding. You know, our, our viruses aren't coming from origins as much anymore. They're coming from the environment. You know, I, I, I use the analogy, God's got a pepper shaker. And <laughs> we're just seeing it show up here and there. And 
and we don't, you know, we're learning some things about the vectors and the, um, the reservoirs of these virus agents, but it doesn't appear to be the vines next to them, which makes it, makes it particularly interesting. So we've got a lot of clean mother blocks. Um, we're keeping them clean. Um, we got a lot of certified buds, but never the clone you want. Um, <laughs> we got more and more certified 2010 protocol buds, um, and that's getting bigger and bigger. All, I think all nurseries are switching over to that as we cycle through. And so we've got plenty of certified wood. We're still getting our clones. If you, you know, in California, Chardonnay Clone 4 is a popular clone. It's a big cluster, highly productive clone. We got our first 2010 protocol vines of that last November. So we're still blowing it up and converting over to 2010 protocol. There's some vines outside ready to go into our new increase blocks. Um, and they'll be blown up over the next few years. Um, one important thing I think that we do that I, I think is kind of unique, and I, I hope other nurseries do this and, and that you guys demand this, is if you get a vine from us, it's going to have a, a, a plain English label on it that says Pinot Noir, Clone 115, French, you know, slash 309 rootstock. And then it's going to have all, left on it from our production system our actual production labels. So when you get a, um, a vine from us, which way does this work? Um, the red button. Other red button. Maybe not. There it is. I had something going. There we go. Um, so if you get a, a label, a vine from us, that's Dorit, D-I. Uh, that's the clone, clone three. If, if a certain consultant or a cu large customer, I can't do 3,000 vines this way, wants to come in and test our mother blocks and have specific wood used for that order, we can actually code that in our production from our Santa Fe ranch, block four, and then we can do the same thing with the rootstock 03916 clone one all the way across, certified, certified, so that when you get the vines, if you'll take these labels, stack them up four or five deep and hang them on your drip wire by the end post. That's my advice. Even take the shipping labels, hang them on your drip wire by the end post. If we ever have a problem in your block, if you see some stuff two or three years in, you can uh, pull those labels off and we will be able to tell you exactly where the budwood and the rootstock came from. We can show you testing histories on that. We can walk through it with you. We can show who else got the same budwood, who else got the same rootstock. So that's, that's what we mean by transparency. If you call us before ordering and you say, I want to know what your testing history has been on the stock items you're going to use in my order, we can actually sh send you one of our plant health reports that has all our testing history, field block inspections on a stock item level, you know, Chardonnay clone four. Um, right, right down like that. Or if you call me and say, hey, what I, the stuff I did last year, give me the plant health reports on that. We can print these out and send them to you. So that's um, Tia's group um, put this together and, and manages that for us. So that's something we want to give you. Um, and then field testing maps. If you're coming into, this is my home ranch here. It's all coming out. It's one of our older increase blocks. That's, a, um, that's about 80 acres of, uh, of increase blocks we have there. It's been coming, it was planted in the late 90s, replanted through the 2000s. It's just long in the tooth and it's time to turn into almond trees. So that's what's gonna happen. Um, but we, we will show you where the wood came from and where the testing and where the proximity to other positives are through a, um, a database we keep. So what do we know about what's going on? Um, we don't know how some viruses spread. Now that's not no longer true. We have an idea how great red blotch spreads. And that's, I think, again, the next presentation. But because we find one vector, for a virus doesn't mean we know all the vectors for a virus. It means we know one of them or two of them. So I, I don't think we can um, make exclusive assumptions about one particular vector being the only mode. Um, we also can't predict adjacency spread rates. I'll show you in a few minutes some adjacency issues we've had in some of the young three to five year old vineyards. And some of those adjacency spread rates are just astronomical. I mean, over half the vines infected with adjacency issues within three to five years. In other cases, we're just not seeing it. So there, there is some kind of a vector that's um, unique to some areas and not others. And we're seeing mosaic spread rates in some blocks also. Viruses pop up out in the middle of a block without necessarily an adjacency pattern. We're wondering, and again, this goes into the realm of unproven, are root residues from old infected vineyard blocks um, potentially reinfecting younger vineyards? We don't know but I'm, I'm getting highly suspect of it. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to hear thoughts on that. Uh, so replant site reinfection is becoming suspicious. We know in cherries with cherry stem hitting virus, that's a, um, a virus that's um, a root residue contact, contact virus, even from vegetable crops. 
Um, in fact, I've been in cherry leaf roll stem pitting vineyards where um, we're suspect that the morning glory, which is related to some vegetable crops, is a reservoir of the virus because we're, we're seeing plant, plantings where the um, field was out of vegetables for four or five years coming up with cherry stem pitting. So it's in plant kingdom, it's not unheard of for um, cross infection with botanical hosts and cross infection from root residues. So it's not proven. Um, Pinot Gris, uh, red blot symptoms in whites. Tia gave me this slide. This is what we're kind of seeing in that. This is an Oregon slide um, from some of our field inspections up here. Uh, red blot symptoms in white again. This is the Chardonnay next to the Pinot Gris. I think the Pinot Gris was an older vineyard and the Chardonnay was planted younger and it's, we're starting to see some, some movement into the, um, into the newer vineyard. Is that true or is it the other way around, Tia? Doesn't really matter, does it? Yeah. Yeah. So it was going from the Pinot, it looked like it was going from the Pinot Gris to the Chardonnay. And here's a red blotch infection where we have a nice young new vineyard with beautiful red leaves and, um, and just kind of a decrepit old vineyard. So we're really pushing growers. If you've got a red blotch or heavily leaf roll infected vineyard, don't plant right next to it. You know, you've really got to manage adjacency at a minimum. Um, and what, what that distance is, it's not a row width and it's not an avenue. You know, I'd say unless you're getting up to 100, 200 feet, you're probably not there. And I think you're worried more if you're downwind with a new block than if you're upwind with a new block because it looks like a lot of the uh, mealybug vectors that the, the young instars are blowing in the wind. And so that's a major, major mode of travel for them. So anyways, um, adjacency needs to be managed. Um, there's another, another fourth leaf infe infection here. You can see again, the decrepit old vineyard and we've got a third or fourth leaf vineyard right here next to it. You know, not even barely coming into its economic life already debilitated with virus. And, um, and I, I'd say, I can't promise a grower that we don't deliver vines that even with all our testing, you know, and, and as low an instance of testing we have, I can't tell you we can deliver vines that are 0% infected. That wouldn't be realistic and I, I don't think it would be an honest claim. Be close to zero, you know, 0 0.1, 1%, 0 0.01%, it's where we hope to be. But that shouldn't lead to a 50% infection rate within three or four years. Um, something else is going on. So Pinot Gris virus is a new one. I don't know a lot about that, so I won't stay much time on it. Um, that's going to be covered here in a minute. I do believe that in new vineyards, um, you know, we, we talk about sustainable wine growing and reduced input, and some, some folks want to grow organic grapes or, or biodynamic. Um, I, that's your judgment call. Personally, for my increased blocks, I think insect su suppression in a broad way is becoming more and more important. I mean, when you've got leaf hoppers, the Eurofruit mites moving the Pinot Gris virus, you've got mealybugs that are very persistent and take quite aggressive pest control um, to minimize them. Um, insect suppression, and I, I would make the claim that we all want to be green and, and sustainable and, um, in our wine grape growing practices. Building up the reservoir of virus in the environment hurts sustainability. I mean, if, if the principle of sustainability is that we want to leave the industry better than we found it, and we want to leave the, the environment viable for future production of, for agriculture and the, um, for the next generations, then not doing what you got to do to suppress virus and keep it out of your program and leave the vineyards more virus free than we found them is a, is a core sustainability issue. Um, so what should we do? Insect suppression, have a replanting plan where you manage adjacency Consider having a fallow period of your of your sites, you know, with a safflower cover crop or something that's deep rooting or mustards. Um, Glenn's probably got some some great ideas about what's a what's a great um, biological practice for kind of rejuvenating a site. But the the deeper you get organic matter in the soil, the more you're going to decompose the old roots, and um, I think that's important. Uh, test and inspect nursery source blocks, just like the winery comes out to see your block before it buys the grapes. Come see your nursery. But that's just not that hard to get to. Um, you know, or have someone come see the nursery. But, um, but get close to your grapevine suppliers. Understand how they operate. Does the nursery look organized? Do they have professional people doing the level of analysis it takes to give a good quality assurance program? That's important. Um, come down to the nursery, look at your vines in the fall. 
Sick finds start turning red at young ages. Um, and roguing. I think that as a common practice in vineyards now, just like we rogue our mother blocks every year, boots on the ground, I think roguing in the fall, post-harvest or pre-harvest, is a, is a standard vineyard practice now. I think that um, if you can get your... I, I, we, that was agreement? Okay, I don't, I don't speak raptor, but... Um, anyways, um, but roguing. You know, if you can start roguing out vineyards at the sub 1% level, you're going to have a lot longer life of that vineyard than if you keep it... Um, than if you, if you let that virus fester out in your vineyard and start building up. Um, it's, you know, keeping that, keeping that low is important. So strategies for that... Simple higher density vineyard designs. You already do it in Oregon, in California. I know my family, we've been planting these big split quad trellises with three years of training and all kinds of arms and wires. I'm not into that anymore. I assume my vineyard is going to have to have frequent vine removal and replacement. You start wrapping um, around these big trellis systems, wrapping cordons around the wires. Um, it's easy to plant at the, at the line stake in your VSP systems. I like planting on away from the line stake to four foot spacing, two feet off the line stake with a little pencil rod. So if I have to remove that vine, I'm not interfering with a major trellis component, I'm just taking it out. Um, and then if you tear out the vineyard at a younger generation than you expect to, you can shift the vines two feet and then plant on the vine stake in the, in the next generation if the trellis is still good. Uh, higher production clones, that doesn't really make a lot of sense in some parts of Oregon, just because you can't get certain higher production clones as ripe as you might need to in cooler climates, but use um, you know, you're gonna, you need to get in, get into production, make good crops, and, and um, there's gonna be some supply issues. Um, more vigorous rootstocks, again, that may be more of a California advice than it is Oregon. Um, you probably wouldn't wanna put 1103 Paulson in the Willamette Valley. Uh, and then use larger format, more mature grapevines. And this, this is where the infomercial starts. Um, that's an Uber vine. That, that, that vineyard behind it, that's the seven month old vineyard. You know, if you're going to have higher infection rates, more vi more vine to vine replanting, um, you're going to you're going to want to start with a bigger vine. Uh, also, with labor issues coming in the Uber vines, the way we recommend it, there's YouTube videos I have. I'm not going to show you today, where we we show you how to plant and train an Uber vine with no green training. You plant it, you let it grow the first year, you lay down dormant canes during winter, you let them grow, you lay down extensions or replacement canes during the second winter and you're not doing green training, you're not doing suckering because the rootstock is all disbudded. And uh, that's a potted variant. I see Eckert's got a dormant field grown variant in the back there, which is the original German Uber vine, right? <laughs> this is our, our field rep, Stefan Daniels, a friend of Eckert's is German. He came back from Germany about seven, eight years ago, just telling us, you gotta do some Uber vines. So we made him 200 to get him to be quiet. Turned out he was right. Um, so, uh, this is an emerging industry practice. You can see for our 2016, this was last fall, um, Uber vine sales were making up about 35% of our sales in grapevines. And so it's actually making up the majority of our revenues in grapevines now. So Magnum's an Uber. I know Joel Myers, our field rep up here in Oregon, he sells a lot of Magnum's up here, um, which is a slightly shorter version. And so this was a Larry Bedig is a farm advisor down in a Monterey County in California did an Uber vine trial with one of the major wineries properties. And if you look here at the standard vines, no production the second year, um, four, four and a half tons is the third year. With the Uber vines, not thinning the crop, this is kind of let, let the dogs run test here. You got almost three tons the second year. And what is that? Six and a half or better tons the third year. So if you add the extra production in the third year to the production in the second year, you're getting five accelerated tons of production within 30 months of planting. And so if you look at the, the direct cost savings of labor and training, and then you look at accelerated production, um, the fact that you're paying about $6 for a grapevine versus $3 for a grapevine is, uh, fades quick. Um, it, it, economically, it's making a lot of sense. Um, this is a... Uh, this only works on the Apple computer, but I've actually got this harvesting. This is the 18-month uh, harvesting photo of my Cabernet up at Georgetown off Uber Vines. So um, you can see that that was about a three or four ton crop on that particular part of the ranch, a big clustered clone. But um, you can see the, the trunk diameter there. 
Yeah, again, that is an 18 month old vineyard there. Um, this year we expect five tons off this same block, maybe six. So if you're going to have shorter vineyard life because of virus infections and whatnot, then I think you're going to have, um, it's going to be an advantage to get in quicker, get into production quicker, keep the vineyard simple and be, be able to turn those vines over in roguing passes and then being able to turn the vineyard over perhaps before the trellis is completely spent. You might not be dozing out the first vineyard you plant to a trellis. You might be, uh, you might be replanting it vine to vine. That's it. Our friends day is May 6th down at Dwarty Nursery, big open house, um, trade show, whatnot. And I've got time for questions. Yes. So Glenn. still have replants.